Okay, let's we'll stop. You can, you can usually hit that right there. And now it's like a. Uh, have you hit the. Uh, have you hit this side yet? Have you just started yet, bro? Have you hit, have you hit the bottom? Have you hit the bottom? <laughs> no. Scott got me on that one because you were in the and I kept like moving it over. Yeah. And he's like, just like that. And I'm going to go kind of over the bottom. Tell me about this. Hey, if you can, um, I'd like you to take out the books. Look at chapter three. Hopefully, you have found uh, the last two times that we have met together. They're official. Tonight, we are looking at this chapter entitled, How Can I Help My Family Actually Be Together? How many of you find yourself in the same room with your family, yet you find yourself disconnected from your family? It seems like we find ourselves in that, that uh, situation quite a bit. Um, two things that we're going to do tonight, we're going to have a little discussion time in the middle of the time tonight where we're going to be talking about identity, what you found out by looking at your kids' pictures on their phone or on their social media. We're going to talk about that at the tables. First, before we do that, Kevin Calvert's going to talk about dealing with distractions and uh, how he has uh, dealt with distractions from technology in his own life. We'll do the discussion questions, then Paul and Julie Weiss are going to finish up tonight with how we can spend time with our families while we're in the same room. Some practical suggestions on how to do that. But Kevin will go ahead and share with us first. So uh, when Drew asked me to do this, I envisioned a room with like 20 people in it. So uh, it's a little bit different, but um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the technology director at Stillwater Schools. I have two daughters, one's in seventh grade and one's in fifth grade, so I'm going to mainly stay on this technology topic because I think I'm in a few years going to experience what some of you are already up against with the teenagers. Um, for me anyway, technology interruptions, this is something that uh, the best way I can explain it is, is we, I kind of need to have a handle on this before I can talk to my kids about it. Um, one of the things I'm always aware of is a lot of times when I'm frustrated with my own usage, then I have a tendency to maybe overreact and not see the reality of what my kids are doing with their phone quite as clearly as I would like to. So just to start off, um, Drew talked about this a little bit last week, but mainly what I want to do is just, it's kind of that oxygen mask scenario where you've got to take care of yourself first before you, can, before you can help someone else. And so a lot of what I'm going to focus on tonight, it's not going to necessarily be in the context of... Um, you managing your, your child's usage is going to be a lot more about how can you manage your own usage. So just to start off, um, just kind of getting at the scope of what the problem is, it's, there's one way to look at it, and we talk about how we think about these things, and one of the things is, is inboxes and interruptions, and so inboxes is how many different things in a given day do you have to deal with on your phone or in your life? How many decisions do you have to make? You know, it starts in the morning a lot of time with alarms, you've got phone calls, voicemails, calendars, meetings, texts, routines, chats, email, systems at work. I have two. I have, when people have a problem, they put in a ticket, they ask for help. Um, then we have another system that anytime something goes down in the district, it interrupts all of us and we have to go fix it. Then you have social media, or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, these things that we choose to, um, choose to follow. Then we have the apps on our phones, we have the Campus Portal, we have the Uversion Bible app, we have weather, we have games, and then any other websites we like to cheat to check, like sports maybe. And then you get home at the end of the day, you dealt with all of that, you go to your mailbox and you have a whole bunch of stuff that you have to pull out of your mailbox and deal with. So a few years ago we didn't have to deal with all of this. And when we look at this list, um, just take 30 seconds and kind of just go through this and count up how many of these that you have. And like for instance, if you have Work email, home email, that would be two. If you have a desk phone on your desk and you have a cell phone, that, that's, that's four. Um, you're going to have to take calls on both and you're going to have to take voicemail. So just take about 30 seconds and just kind of run through this real quick and just get an idea in your mind about how many things you have to deal with on a given day.
All right. Um, does anybody have more than, I think all of us have more than five. Anybody have more rid of apps and red back? Signaling everything we've missed, it immediately triggers a whole set of thoughts, feelings, and concerns in our mind. Um, it's funny that you unlock your phone, all those little badge icons, it's a little in the corner of your, your phone, a little icon that tells you how many other emails you, emails you have. That's, it's red to get your attention. And so, I don't know, when you, you kind of think about what happens when you unlock your phone, sometimes it's a good feeling, sometimes it's a bad feeling. For me, anyway, the way that I look at this is, is there's kind of a gap between the way that I'm living my life today and the way that I may see that I should be living my life or the way that I want to live my life. And more and more, I look at my phone as a significant um, force in that gap to either make it bigger or smaller. Um, for example, like if I want to, if I want to, you know, have a better relationship with my dad, you know, I don't want to call him. Um, if I come home from work and I've had a, a, a long day and I pull out my phone and I spend some time on a game or a website or something like that, um, that thought about calling my dad is the farthest thing from my mind. And I get to the end of the day, at the end of the night, and I'm like, oh man, I forgot to call my dad. If I would have used my phone to call my dad, if the gap would have got smaller. I would have used my phone to connect with him. But if I, if I don't, if I distract myself and I forget to do it, that gap gets bigger. So a lot of these things that I've kind of dealt with has been just really looking at and thinking about how do I, how does the phone contribute, how do these interruptions contribute to that gap between how I want to live my life and how I'm currently living it. And what happens is we have all those systems, and they started out with was maybe one system or two systems, and over time we've added another, we keep adding systems to the pile. And notifications are really easy, like you need to check your, you need to text, you need a group text, you need something, just let it pop up on your phone, it's not a big deal. But then you take, you take a step back and you look at it, you've got so many notifications that are hitting you all day long. And there's a consequence to that. The more that you switch your attention, the higher your stress level goes. And then they've done some studies, and they say the more that you're interrupted, the more likely you start to interrupt yourself. Um, they've just kind of like video recorded people, you know, watching them do work. And once they get interrupted at a certain point, they'll start a task, like opening up, I love this slide. Um, they'll open up Word or they'll open something up and then they'll immediately, while they wait for it to load, they'll pull their phone out. And then they've gotten to the point where they measure that it usually is about 45 seconds. People will self-interrupt 45 seconds once they get into this mode. And so you feel like you're busy, but you're not really necessarily productive. And you feel really frustrated because you're trying to get something done and it feels like you're just slogging through it because you can't get to it. Some of the ways you can deal with it, you can maybe try and cut down the number of systems you use. You know, you see people that cut out social media accounts. They just don't think it's worth it. Some people just give up. I'm not even going to check my phone. I'm going to stick it, stick it over in the corner. But sometimes it doesn't work with our spouses or it doesn't work with our, our work. We could train people who interact with us to maybe get them to only bother us in a certain way. But I don't know about you. Anytime that I've tried that, I think of this. Never been, have ever been in a group text that just never end? And it's like, could this not be sent as an email? Does this really need to be a thing that we're talking about right now? So the approach that I'm going to talk about is let's just manage this intentionally. How can we manage this a little bit better than what we did? Because when you first install an app or you start using something, the defaults that the companies come up with, like what you get out of the box, it's not in your best interest. Um, they're always going to pick a way of doing it where they're going to capture as much time of your time and attention as they possibly can. That's what they're trying to do. So just be aware, we're going to get into a little bit of details on this. On your phone, you have, they're called notifications. They're the things that pop up and bother you when you're trying to do things. Most phones you swipe down from the top, and you can get a list of, of all of them. So there's a few different ways to manage these. One is in your phone. On each individual app, you can say, I want to see all the notifications. I want the notifications to only show silently, or I don't want any notifications at all. And so we were lucky. Apple came out with an update yesterday, so all of these screenshots have been updated with that. So they look a little different. But on the new update, when you get a notification on your iPhone, which is what most of the people in the room are using, so I'm just going to focus on that, um, you can swipe to the left. When you swipe to the left, you can say, hey, I don't want to get notifications from this app anymore. So for instance, I don't necessarily want Walmart or Amazon to tell me every time there's a sale. I, I, I've got stuff to do during the day. But because I have those apps on my phone to make things easier, they're going to pop up all the time and interrupt me. So I can swipe left and I can say, hey, turn off, don't leave me alone. I mean, leave me alone. And a lot of this stuff, 
It's not really complicated technically. It's not a hard thing to do. Our phones are generally, they're designed so that we can kind of use them. It's taking the time to do it that's usually the opposite. Um, we get interrupted over and over and over again and we just never, we just, it's, it's so quick to deal with it that we never have the time to just count the cost of it. On the other hand, and sometimes you do want notifications, like with email or some other things, you, you want to be notified in certain situations. In those, you have these in-app settings. If the app supports it, you can really kind of tailor, tailor it a little bit as to how you're going to get interrupted. So like version is a great example of this. You have to create an account before you can, and log in before you can change these notification settings, but there's some great things here. You can go in and you can, um, I don't necessarily want news or friend requests or comments or any of this, but um, I sure do like that streaks reminder, and I sure do like getting the verse of the day in the morning. So I can go in there and I can say, you know, I generally wake up at a certain time, about 15 minutes before I wake up. I want to get a notification that has the verse of the day. Um, it's a great way to start the day, and then you also get to read the Bible verse out of context, which I know Sonny Brook loves, and so it's like a <laughs> double win. So I really like that. YouTube is another one. You go into the settings, and you can turn things on like dark mode, which we'll talk about the effect of um, staring at a screen before bed. But you can turn on dark mode. You can turn on restricted mode, which, I mean, they've only got computers doing it, but it's better than nothing for your kids. Um, you can turn off all notifications, which is really handy. And so there's just some things in there that if you kind of, you can also say, hey, remind me to take a break, or remind my kid to take a break if you do this on their phone. Like every 30 minutes, I just want to pop up and say, hey, you've been watching YouTube for 30 minutes. So this is some of the things that you can do in app. Another tip is, is you know, some of these, the way they want you to use them, like Remind, a lot of the schools use Remind, I don't need texts and notifications from my teachers every time they want to tell me something. Um, but everything they send you is like, sign up with the app, get the app, get the app. You can go in and you can you know, follow these instructions, you join, and you can enter an email address and you can get emails instead of notifications on your phone. It makes it so much easier because you still get the information, but you're not constantly getting interrupted throughout the day. By the way, I have a copy of this. There's links in there that will take you to all of these instructions. And so at the end, I have a link, and you can pull it up and, and, pull, and pull all of this. That kind of leads a little bit into email, which is probably where a lot of us, you know, if you look over you know, my home and I'm doing work, most of the time what I'm dealing with is email. I mean, it just seems like it sucks a lot of time. And so same thing. There's some things we can do to, to cut the load that we have with email. Um, I, I kind of joke about this. I'm like, I feel like this is like email 101, but there's been so much spam and so much of these other things that it is good to remind ourselves that we can't unsubscribe from a lot of emails. Um, would I rather get you know, 20, 30 notifications in a day every time I get an email comes up? Or do I know that generally I'm going to check my email two to three times a day anyway? And so when I check it, I can just deal with it then. And so the other thing you can do is you can say, I'm either going to skip the inbox or I'm going to disable notifications entirely unless it comes from somebody important like maybe my, sp my spouse or my kids or my boss. And so these are all options to help us do with email. This is a great way. Like this is an example of email you can't unsubscribe from. So right here, you look at the front address. This is not a legit thing because it's, you know, it's like the Lapagos Cruise and it's crystallize.offshore.com. Like it says right there, you can unsubscribe, but it's not from a real company, so you're wasting your time if you unsubscribe. Newsletters, things from stores, things like that, those are the types of things that they're going to keep sending emails. It takes you two seconds to delete. When you look at back over like the course of the day, you're making decisions all day long about what to do with that email. And it's called decision fatigue, and you get to a point where you're like, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted, or my brain is tired. Every time you see one of these, you have to decide. It adds up. I mean, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 of these in a day, it just it wears at you. Another thing you can do, and this one is probably farther down the rabbit hole than we really, really want to go, but you can use filters and rules in your emails to really kind of like dial this in to make your life easier. So an example is, is at work, I'm going to check my work email in the course of the day. If I have email from coworkers, I'm going to probably check that three or four times a day. Um, if I'm going to get emails from maybe like people from outside of my company, I don't need to check that like once a day. If I get an email that has you know, the word unsubscribe in it, I'm only going to check that maybe two or three times a week. And so there's rules that I've set up, and there's some more info here on how to do it, that will kind of walk you through 
how you can go in and kind of look at different ways to look at your email just to kind of make your life easier throughout the course of the day. Um, part of what I've looked at is I'm trying to manage the amount of effort and the amount of time I'm putting into work so that when I come home at the end of the day, um, you know, Matt Chandler has that quote about, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be exhausted and tired. Well, I'd like for that to be at the end of the day, not when I get home from work. I'd like to be there for my family. And so some of these things keep me a little bit more mentally fresh where then I can come home and I can be a little bit more present than um, just dealing with this. Um, some of the rules that I've tried to do in my life, you know, working with my wife on when I'm going to work and when I'm not going to work, um, it's always that balance between the results um, and accountability and then for both the work and your family. And so one of the things that's been really helpful is just going in there like, I, I am going to work when these situations arise. I'm not going to work and I'm not going to have email notifications after I leave work at the end of the day. And so some of these things, some of these technical rules have made it where I'm not making a choice in the moment when my phone beeps as to what I'm going to do about it. Um, I, I'm, these filters, I know this is like crazy stuff, so it does excite me. Um, <laughs> One thing, though, that I just will add, these kind of things, if they're a means to an end, they're great. If you're just doing it to do it, it doesn't really help you very much. Here's a great one. I call this the calendar trick. So this is a big help to me, so I have my anniversary and calendar. It repeats every year. That's not the calendar trick. That's what we, most of us do with calendars. Here's the calendar trick. It's down here in most systems. You can go in here and you can say, how often do I want to be notified? This is where notifications shrink that gap between how I want to be. So you can go in here and put like six of them. So like before my anniversary, I get an email two weeks out. That's like we're gonna do like the platinum package and like you know we're going on a trip or something. That never happens, but you know the options there. <laughs> so you know one week out is like okay we're gonna get babysitters and we need to call the in-laws. So I get an email then it's like hey how are we gonna play this this year? How's how's the wife feeling? How are we gonna do this? So that's the babysitter. That's probably what every two three years. Then you have the, the three-day, okay, I'm going to order something from Amazon for, and I need prime shipping, so I can still get it here in time. Then you have the one-day out, which is, okay, make sure the flower shop's open, you might want to call them. And then there's the, the 10 minute ahead of time, did you send a text, did you at least, you know, did you not forget? Probably need to tweak the time on that a little, oh, 7 a.m., so it's before she leaves for work, so we're good there. Um, but these are things with recurring events. Um, I've had presentations that were, I've had events with the kids, things like that, where they've had projects do. This is a great tool to teach them, to help them manage. It helps me, I can put this in my calendar and I can remind them. I really like to teach them these tools so that they can put this in their calendar and instead of me nagging them about getting something done, their, their, their system that they use is nagging them to get something done. It really kind of flips it. Well, instead of this thing that makes our life harder, it makes our life easier. So one thing on this that I try and I have to remind myself with my kiddos to have this compassion about this because I don't think we understand how far the deck is stacked against us with this. Um, these companies, they really want our time and attention. They want to sell us ads. And so if they can't give you notifications, they have other tricks. And they call them engagement and retention strategies. So engagement is to get you in their app and retention is to keep you using their app. And they've got psychologists on staff. They've got conferences they go to to talk about this, like the deck is stacked. And so some of the things they're going to do, once you kind of know these tricks, it kind of helps you pick them out. So likes, you know, they're taking advantage of we all like to be liked. And so they're, a lot of times they know if someone likes you, you're going to like them back. And so it's going to increase the usage of their app. They're kind of working off of that social contract. Streaks, um, even my middle school knows about Snapchat streaks, um, my fitness pal streaks. Um, Bible app streaks. So it's just getting you in that app every single day. Once you have a habit, then you're going to keep with it. Infinite scrolling, if you've noticed when you're you know, looking at videos or news or anything on a website, it never comes to the end. If you come to an end and you have to click to a second page, then you're going to make a decision. Have I spent enough time on this? Do I want to go do something else? If you just keep scrolling, there's no friction and it just never ends. The same thing, we all know auto playing videos. I mean, we just watched one, why not? I'll just watch one more. So they use this on us, they use this on our kids. Gaming a lot, probably have some kids' games, we might have some puzzle game addicts in the room. Um, but challenges, achievements, leaderboards, these are all things that demonstrate mastery. Uh, challenges, a lot of times, are time sensitive. You have to do this before this time, so you need to do it today, or you need to do it this week. Again, it keeps you interested. There's novelty. There's things that are constantly changing. 
Same thing with loot boxes. You see this a lot in games. This is where there's pretty much a slot machine. Like you're going to play for a certain amount of time and you're going to get this prize and the prize is going to like roll a dice and sometimes you're going to get something awesome and sometimes you're going to get something that's not very good. And they know through their research that if you get something on a predictable schedule, you figure it out and it's not fun anymore. They know that if you get it on a random schedule, you're going to keep going back and back and back. Um, grinding is a similar thing. It's when you know, someone's playing a game and it's not fun anymore, but they want to get to a level. It's just hard work. I'm like, man, it'd be great if my kids could take that hard work from playing a game and apply it to real hard work, but that's essentially what they're doing. They just want to keep them in the game so they can get some ridiculous achievements so they can drive to their friends. The other thing, too, a lot of times as a parent, I'm like, hey, you want a game that's free? No problem. It doesn't cost me any money, but it costs my kids time, and they're going to constantly pop up ads, and they're going to constantly try and get them to do something. The way a lot of these games work is, is there's a thing called whales, and essentially it's like they make more money off of you know, 10, 20 percent of the people that spend ridiculous amounts of money on you know, clothing for a cat character in some random game. Um, they just get totally sucked in, and it becomes really important. There's been some studies that show that, even, that younger kids can't even differentiate between what's happening in like what's in-game things, like in-game currency, in-game um, items, and real-world items. So it's just as real to them as like something you know outside the world is to us. There's some other things that can help. I'm a big believer in this. I can't use my phone about 15. If I use my phone about for about 15 minutes before bed, I can't. I have a hard time getting to sleep. Same thing. There's research that shows that. You know, you're looking at blue light, which is just like the sky. Um, it, there's all kinds of theories behind it, but I know for me that if I turn that blue light off, I have an easier time going to sleep. It might not affect you, but it might affect your kid. Um, there's some apps here I've listed that will, or instructions on your device that tell you how to turn that on. Same thing, those streak apps. There's some things you can do. There's some apps, they're habit apps, that you can turn it around. Like, say you're trying to, to have your own goal, or you're trying to accomplish something, and your kid's trying to accomplish something. It's kind of like sticker charts when you're 80 Um There's apps like Stride that can do it on the phone, where it'll pop, pop up and remind you. It doesn't just have to be for the Bible app or whatever. Ad blockers, if you want to look into these, um, harder to do on the phone, really important on um, computers. You know, these ads that are on the side of pages are really inappropriate. We're really good as adults at blocking them out. Um, but I've just been times where I'm you know, looking at news on a website and my kid comes up next to me and I look over and I'm like, they don't know if I'm looking at the news or I'm looking at that crazy ad on the side. So these things, they really cut down the things that you um, are unconsciously filtering out or the things that you see. Finally, last one, the computer, the computer tip, like manage your passwords with LastPass. I talk about you know, what are the things that save you time and makes your life easier. There's nothing that's going to take more time than someone getting your account and using it, and then you gotta go clean it all up. And so a lot of times what they do is you use a password on this website, use a password on this website, this website gets hacked, they go to Facebook or Gmail and they say, I wonder if this person used the same account over here. If I can, I can get in, I can send it out a bunch of spam and a lot of bad emails. And so um, there's no way with all of the systems that we can use that you can really memorize a different password for every single different app, so it's just easier to use a utility to do it. This is awesome. Um, all of the phone companies now are realizing how far this, the pendulum has swung to driving us crazy. And so both Android and Apple are coming out with new ways to manage your screen time. This came out on Tuesday. It's called Screen Time. Apple came out with it. It's under settings. There's more info linked there. Essentially what it does is it tells you how much in a given day you or your kid are using your phone. You can set restrictions on this. Um, you can set a password if you go over a certain amount of time on a certain category like social networking um, or a given app, you can uh, block them out and that's it for the day. And so, you know, anything that's automatic and we don't have to, you know, I think in my head sometimes I'm nagging my kid about this, but anything that's automatic and just happens without me thinking about it or enforces the rules, it just makes it so much easier. This is also originally going to say, you know, sometimes it might be helpful to make a list of how many notifications you get in a given day, but that's tedious and time consuming. Same thing, this is a really easy way to see how much in a given day you're using your phone. Um, Android is gonna be a little bit before theirs, is, theirs comes out, but it uh, just came out Tuesday for, for Apple. To wrap it up, the way I think about this, you know, we're talking about right quick, we're talking about how we think about things. The way I think about it is I think about how I'm using my phone. Am I you know, consuming, am I working, am I connecting? How is that contributing to that gap? between how I'm 
how I'm living my life today and how I want to be living my life, or how I feel like I'm being called to live my life. Um, I've been convicted a lot of times, like I'll start, you know, making a pot of coffee or whatever and instantaneously pull up my phone and start looking at news. And I'm like, you know, you, you look at some of these books on spiritual discipline and some things like that, and it seems like there's a given assumption that there's a certain level of quiet in your mind so that you can um, have some way to connect with your creator. And over and over and over again, I feel convicted about, you know, maybe I need to distract myself a little bit less because I don't know if he's going to get past my phone unless he's yelling at me. Um, again, minimize your notifications, another rule of thumb. Try and, if you can make your notifications where they come from people only, it's a good way to look at it. I'm only going to get notifications from people. I'm not going to get it from anything else. You can customize your social media feeds. Instead of looking at that person that always has that irritating comment that is going to get an emotional reaction from you, you can always just unfollow and tweet that feed. There's a lot more literature. Uh, this humane tech, this is an ex-Google engineer um, who's written a lot of stuff about how you can approach this. They've got some like, things on I mean, some things that are way out there. Like they're turning their phones completely gray because there's some people that are struggling with some pretty serious phone addiction. You might have some kids that are struggling with pretty serious phone addiction. And there's some things like that they figured out that are pretty far out there that you can do that will really help them get a handle on it and learn how to manage it. So here's the link to the slides. You can talk to me after this. If you want to shoot me an email, shoot me an email and I'll do the best I can. Hey, I knew it was serious whenever you brought out the red laser pointer. Hey. I mean, this was pretty awesome. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You guys have it? Everything? Okay, good. So this is what we're going to do. We've got some questions. Um, we sent this out in an email yesterday. This is what I'd like you to talk through at your tables. Um, so these questions, we asked you to look at either pictures on your kid's phone or their social media account, if they have a social media account, um, and answer some of these questions. Talk about this at your table. If your child has a social media smartphone, look at their account and their post and or pictures. Um, first question, in light of what we talked about last week concerning identity formation, we talked about that at length, um, what do these pictures and social media posts tell you about their identity, i.e., what do they value, what things are encouraging about what you see, and then what things concern you? So, spend the next five, ten minutes at your table talking about those things. Yeah. So what you're going to do on Saturday? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's 
talking about murdering someone and he's not posting, you know, awful rap, rap lyrics on there. I'm like, just, just try to let it mature a little bit.
right click and figure out technology because that's not me at all. You know, I, I decided to do a PowerPoint this afternoon. I think it's the second one I've ever done. And I was trying to get the plugins and another right plugins and Kevin's trying to find it and then I see his and I'm like, yeah, you're not going to see my black and white and one word thing. So sorry about that. But I'm not following Kevin with that. Um, uh, we're here to talk about right click and the idea of having fun with your family and spending time together. Um, and that's something that I think we enjoy to do and, and I think we were intentional about and we still are. Our kids are now um, 30 something, 30 something, and 20 something, right? And folks, okay. So grandkids and, 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 and that kind of thing that I think we're still um, focused on what we are as a family and the mission that we have. Even though our kids are in other states and some of you are, um, we kind of we kind of did that. But, and I, and I, I'm going to say this because a lot of you are very gracious to say, hey, I just want to be your family, da, 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 and that makes us feel really, really good. But we want to remind you very, very clearly up front that we didn't, we're not rocket scientists, and we didn't figure out all the answers. We just kind of learned and made mistakes and dropped things and broke them, and then, you know, we just chose that we're trying to go after this, and we're trusting God uh, and, and the things that he has provided for us as a family to help raise our kids and raise them in a way that they would know Jesus. And that, that kind of was our mission. You know, getting married, we knew we wanted to have kids, right? And we knew we wanted to have a bunch of kids. And we probably didn't have as many as we should have. We would probably have more. 
Although it's really kind of good. Um, you know, in that kind of thing. But, you know, we didn't know. We brought Titus home as a baby, and, you know, it's like everybody else. We, you know, are we going to break this thing? You know, how do we watch it? They, I've seen it in a tub, you know, and we're just, we worried those things. And then we had Morgan, and we understood, you know, fighting and sibling rivalry. We learned that even though I had, we all had a lot of siblings, and we had a lot of rivalry when, when it's your kids. You know, we had to walk through that, right? Just like you guys have to. And we saw Morgan and Titus had each other, and still are, in their 30s, but still... Come to Christmas and see us fight. It's really fun. And then Austin came along and we got to see the two fight over him. And he's the laid back one and everybody wants him to be the dog or be, you know, the guy who catches the football or whatever. And so we walked through all of that. You know, in our house it was still some of the same things that your house has and you kind of pull it, you know, you you know, kids didn't want to go to church sometimes. Um, they lied to our face. <laughs> Uh, they got grounded. They disappointed us. Uh, they made me lose my pool on numerous occasions. Um, uh, Julie has some great stories about, you know, them saying, you guys are unfair. Uh, that's not fair. They didn't get away with, we hate you. That, that's not going to happen. We didn't let that one happen. But under, the, under their breath down the hall, especially one of our children, <laughs> we said one time to Julie, that sucks, which that was a word we didn't allow to say at her house. And, and we walked down the hall, just you know, that kind of thing. So we dealt with that stuff, just like you did. And and, uh, and we tried to navigate all of those things, and we still struggled. Uh, we knew that our responsibility was to do this. Um, and yet, it, many times we felt like, who are these kids, and what did we do wrong, and, and how come they're not coming around? Um, so how did we get there? Well, I think we got there by the grace of God, number one, right? We understand that the gift of a family and a marriage is from God, and that's, that's the grace that he provides. Uh, we, we, we were sold out to the church family. And I know I, I'm a pastor. I work at a church. But we grew up in families who are pastors. But if, if I wasn't a pastor and, and our kids weren't in ministry, the church family has is, is got to be a priority. And I say that to you. That, um, you can do all these things, and you get all the answers to things, but if the church family isn't a priority and your kids know that, you're going to struggle. And it's going to happen. Um, the utilization of other adults in their lives was, was counting out, you know. So for us, it was mainly other church men and women. And so um, I, I intentionally didn't put my kids as youth minister in my group. I, I wanted them with other godly men and women, sometimes young, sometimes old. Uh, when, I, when I was trying to find jobs, it was through people in the church and sometimes outside of that. But I wanted them to help me help my sons and daughters learn how to, to do things right and well. And, and we wanted to hear from a babysitter or a parents of a babysitter if Morgan didn't clean up and didn't put the dishes in the dishwasher. We, want, we wanted those kinds of things, and we wanted those things to be known. And it wasn't just church, though. It was, for us, it was our aunts and uncles. We wanted our aunts and uncles to be around our kids, and so family was a big deal. And, and we wanted, because that was a positive, we wanted them to be around that and the cousins, and that was a joy. That was, frankly, our vacations. We didn't go to Disneyland. We, we didn't go take a trip to Colorado unless I was speaking and, and they all jumped in. It, we didn't have those. We just chose that our vacation and our two weeks of vacation every year was going to be Thanksgiving, Christmas, or a summer event when I was at camp and all Julie getting together with her sister and all these grandkids or all these kids and cousins together. And then I would say coaches and teachers, obviously, you know, try to identify someone, you know, they have an interest in reading and Morgan had some teachers that were incredible in feeding that for her. And we wanted to know their teachers, and we wanted to get involved in that. And how did we invest in that as a, you know, PGA mom or whatever that might be, or coaching? I actually didn't do a lot of coaching with my kids during during the sports that they played, and, and intentionally chose not to do that. And although I did a lot of coaching, I did not coach that way. Um, but I we, we lifted up coaches like a Mike Cortez, who coached in Park and Rec for years. Um, you know, he was he's a great man who 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 mentored our boys in a way that he didn't even know he was doing just because he was a, he was a godly, God-fearing, gentle spirit and how he handled that. And so we looked for those kinds of people. Uh, so we didn't have a notebook. We didn't have a scenario. We didn't have this plan, and we executed the plan. And this is what you need. For ninety nine ninety five. you can get this, and you two can have awesome kids. We don't have awesome kids. We have an awesome God who, by the grace of God, allowed them to try to live for him and still struggle, right? They're not perfect at all. And so here's the questions that we have to have, and here's where we want to be a little bit practical with you. 
Uh, so as we move, especially, I know that some of you have high school, a lot of you, some of you have younger, some of you don't even have kids yet. Um, but this is kind of how we navigate it. Somewhere, we, it's kind of quick, like, okay, we need to have a plan for some of the things that are happening. We had three kids, we were in a smaller house. We knew we, we needed a, we'd love to have a little bit more space. We had one living area, and we had uh, three bedrooms, and we had boys sharing a room, and, and Morgan needed her own room, and they're all in the older elementary, and we were trying to figure out, can we afford and so the first thing we asked is, you know, where do we want to live in this season for our family? And so that was kind of a priority as we began to search. We we're also in transition. I was honestly contemplating whether we needed to stay in Stillwater at that time, and my wife was busy searching for houses. <laughs> and I just remember I wasn't comfortable with her searching. Hey, I'm not buying. I'm just looking. And she's uh, an incredible deal finder, and I was an incredible. I'm not sure if we're supposed to be here. And it was literally her... Yeah, that's fine as long as you don't touch. And, you know, as long as you don't have to, if you sign something without me, then we're fine. And, and it was really praying through that and the grace of God, talking with some elders and said, here's what I'm thinking, tell me, and got some confirmation to stay. And, and then God provided that home that we are still in. And we wanted to go from one living area, which was our dining room and, and living area, to two. Because we wanted to create a space. Uh, for this season for our family. We needed space not only for them to have a room, but we needed space for them to have activity. So we wanted another living area. And again, this is not about how to be suburbia, perfect family. Just for us, that was a priority. Whether that means keeping this car longer or whatever, we, we believe that this is, if we're going to spend our money, let's spend it this way. Because our purpose was to have a place for where our, our kids, we could do what we were called to be, which is to model and example and train our, our kids to grow up to know Jesus and to love him and to live faithfully for him. And then hopefully they would marry into that and they would carry that on. That I feel like that was the primary thing that we had. And so we knew we had 10 years uh, uh, away and that was a part of the goal. Uh, we were 10 years for them being out of the house, 68 years for them driving. Uh, we knew that puberty was coming and all the 14 year old attitudes or you know, we hate mom now, like Morgan did for two years of that. Dad was awesome. Mom was a, the stupidest person in the world. Um, yes. Uh, so, and so that was one of the primary purposes of why we want to do that. We want to create a place um, where we could have them there. So we wanted them to have, we wanted them to want to have their friends at our house. And that was just for us. Um, sounds controlling. For us, it's like we wanted to know what was going on with our kids', kids lives. And so that was... A valuable way to do that is to have a space where they came over uh, and we wanted them to feel like this is a place they wanted their kids to come. And what we found is that we tried to create an environment that their kids wanted to be at our house. Matter of fact, a lot of times they came over to our house and their kids weren't there. They still do, by the way. And so that is something that we enjoyed and, and that's who we were uh, and that's definitely some things that we wanted to do uh, in getting to that. And so that was one of the questions that we asked. Uh, and then the other one was, what is the goal for our family? What are we trying to do? And like I said, uh, it's, it's for them to know Jesus and, and to live for him. And then help us navigate the things, the nuances of puberty and girlfriends and boyfriends and people not liking you and liking you. And how do we bring you to know that your family is safe? And so unequivocally, um, this is stepping back. And these are some things that we held to as values as uh, Paul and Jude and Luis. Um, that God is the center of our family. And so that was just, and so if God is the center, then um, at that time we didn't have Wednesday nights. But Sunday nights and Sunday mornings were, were, were for church, and our activity was about church things, and we wanted to be a part of that. Um, I always, I told this to my kids numerous times, still tell them, and we told them even at early age, that you know, God is the center of our family, and then mom is always more important than you are. I just said that over and over to my three kids. I remember when they were little. You know what? Ah, we want to go with you. You guys are going to Bronx. Are you good? No, we're not going to Bronx. We're just going to sit in the car and not be around you. We hired like, <laughs> my kid to give mom some space. And, and so, because mom is more important, they would even reply to that. And you know what they do? They do it as they're hugging us in the kitchen around our legs, right? It was very affirming. The thing that you think, well, that's not fair because kids are pretty important. No, not more important than Julie. It never will be. Okay? Not more Julie's not more important than God, but she is more important than everything else. Does that make sense? Um, and, I, and, and you hear why I'm going there. But the kids are next. They're pretty important. 
They're just not that important. And they're not that important. Okay? I'm not lessening their importance. I'm just making sure that they're not more important than God and not more important than their mom. And then my children are next. And so that means other things like what we talked about, being on my phone or hobbies, which I love my hobbies. I love my sports. Um, but the Cardinals can't be more important than Titus and Oscar. You know, the Broncos, OSU, whatever it might be. And matter of fact, their sports teams is not them, by the way. Okay? So my kid playing baseball is not more important than my kids. Right? My kids are more important than the baseball they're playing, than soccer they're kicking, right? Than the, the ACT test they're taking. I'll go down the line. The college they go to, right? That's not more important uh, than that. Okay, that's me preaching. Okay, so... How do we have fun? This will be talking about having fun. Um, you know, um, and this is where Julie is, is great at it, is that we cre created, created a place where they wanted to be there, uh, gave us a chance to know the kids, whether they're church kids or non-church kids, know the background, have questions, invite their families over. There'd be numerous Friday nights. There would be 30, 40 people in our house playing loud upstairs and maybe families playing cards or, or doing whatever. And so that's what we did. Most of the stuff we did was cheap, right? We didn't all plan, hey, we've got to plan a trip and all go to the beach in Florida. Yeah. But we didn't have the money for that, right? And we weren't going to, not waste, we just weren't going to value because we wanted this house more than we wanted that vacation. And so we wanted this house as a place that we figured 24-7 for the next 10 years is going to pay off. And so we're going to wake up, we're going we're gonna to grow, we're going to have a dog and he's going to die in this house, right? We're going to go through all the nuances of, Morgan, you know, crying because she didn't get invited to prom or, and, you know, you know, and, and just saying, well, you know what, we're going to pull out popcorn and M&Ms and we're going to play a game. And that was some natural things we could do. Julie sent out a text. She's a little bit nervous about this. She sent out a text and Morgan laughed because it's about 530. He goes, did you see mom's text? Four thirty. Oh, you was earlier. Yeah. She sent a text to the kids. Okay, what, tell me some things that we did. And every one of them responded and things that we forgot about. So I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about some of the things that we did. Okay. okay, so some of the things we did that just for fun with our kids. Um, Paul was youth minister at that point, so he traveled quite a bit. When he was out, we had parties. We didn't, we didn't focus on him being gone. We had fun, right? So we had simple suppers. Like two of my responses from two of my kids today when I asked them what they remember, is I bought little boxes of cereal when he was gone, and they loved that because we never got little boxes of cereal. And it's so stupid, but that's one of the things they remember, right? Um, we would rent a movie, and they could all sleep in my room. We'd watch this little TV with the VCR. I know aging ourselves, but um, a sleeping bag on every side of the bed, right? Just something we no normally wouldn't do. Um, Every year for their birthday, we let them have as many friends over as how old they were. And then early on, I just said, at 10, that's your last birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and nobody Thank argued. you. Thank <laughs> Seriously, nobody argued with us. I mean, they all went, oh, okay. So that's, yeah. So that worked. I don't know why it worked. But. Um, long time ago, we figured out that um, homemade cards or notes that we would write were much more effective than a birthday card. Um, so we um, intentionally do that every birthday. We write a, a note. Um, several years ago, we got them all a box, and they keep all their notes in a box, and they still have those boxes. You have to do some of the special moments. So like when they turned 16, when they graduated high school or college, when they got married, when they got engaged, when they changed jobs, when they, you know, maybe there's something going on. And um, Morgan reminded me that Valentine's Day, we did that as well, where I would write the boys a note and get them a little gift, and Paul would write Morgan a note and get her a gift. So it was just a way to, for them to know that they were loved, um, didn't have to go outside of our house for that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, holidays with friends. If, when they were in college, um, a lot of their friends lived too far away from home to go home, so they would come to our house. Um, and it sounds so stupid, but playing games, they all thought that was the best thing, you know? 
Uh, Easter, we did Easter egg hunts for college kids. And some of them had candy and some had dollars in them. And they were all about dollars, right? So it turned into a big competition. Um, in the fall, we'd have them, if we had a group of college kids, we did uh, a few times did um, pumpkin carving contests. And they'd carve them up and then, you know, Paul would watch them carve them and then we'd say, who's this the best? And they'd go, gift card to Chick-fil-A probably. Um, let's see. Now, at Christmas time, we play special games. We play games all the time anyway. We do board games. Um, we used to be Monopoly people, and uh, when the kids were younger, which can be terribly frustrating because they're all very competitive, and Austin would usually get mad at those houses, but <laughs> still creates memories. Um, and now we play this game called Catan. I don't know if you guys play Catan, but yeah, we, we do that some. Um, we play a lot of cards when they're home. We try to, we just try to keep playing. We'll turn the TV on a music channel so we're not watching it, and we'll just start playing something. Um, their spouses play too. Um, at Christmas, the last couple of years we've done to be together in the same room without our phones. We created a game with saran wrap. You guys have seen it. You know, you wrap up like we did gift cards, like to. $5 for Bahamas, $5 to Chick-fil-A. And then I put candy bars in there. Well, they have to use one hand. And then Nothing. you're rolling, yeah, you're rolling dice in front of them, and if you get a double, then they have to pass it to the group, right? So whoever gets the phone, whoever gets the prize, gets them, and they were all, they were all about that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on their birthdays, we let them choose what they had for dinner. We didn't go out for dinner. Didn't have the money to go out for dinner. <laughs> so we just say, choose your favorite, and that's what we'll make. Um, let's see. Um, there were a few years where our kids had to, we live on the other side of the town from the middle school. So they had to ride with us. Two years, right? But I would drive them to the junior high, and they could get on it there, so they wouldn't be on the bus as long. And then they'd take us right there. And I can remember this till today, but Morgan reminded me that while we were sitting in the bus, we put cards, or in, in the car, waiting for the bus. Yeah, we put cards. Um, and I think part of this is when we have friends over doing this, is part of this is trying to get them to know the friends and know their stories. Because some of their friends had different, difficult situations. And, you know, or they were kind of with grandma, or their parents were kind of checked out, and they kind of had things. And you know, I, I think of some of them that are still around, you know, like a John Nickel. You know, his parents are nice people, they just are not believers, and you know, having them in our house, and a Sam Martin, and just, okay, these are good kids that are in here, and so how do we, you know, how do we, you know, give advice? I mean, just the, the last time we were together, John was over here, oh, it's a 10 year reunion, so Nickel and all those guys are at the house about midnight. Okay, I'm going to bed. But Julie was in the bed because John was talking to her, and they're over here playing cards, you know. And so it's this carried on from fifth grade conversations with uh, men and women and friends, and um, and so that's that's we use these as opportunities. You talk about driving from middle school to junior high. You know, there's this trick of turning up the music to the back, and so those kids have to yell, and you can tell what's going on because they're talking loud, right? So she was aware of what was happening at school and who likes who and what's happening in the dance, and I don't want to go, and that person, and you could have these conversations with our kids, and or we could determine, grade out kids, and okay, I'm a little concerned here, uh, and this was church kids and non-church kids, right, so we had some great church kids and some great non-church kids from our church, and then we had some not-so-great church kids that we kind of processed. One of the things that you would do is Austin was terrible at saying no to his friends, and he just kind of liked to come home sometimes, especially Sundays. Justin Eber was one of his friends, and Justin, if you know Justin at all, Justin says, come on now, 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 he's like a little gym, they like, oh, I mean, no, no, let's all do it, and I'm kind of like that too, so I have to admit that, but and Justin, every night, was Darren and Justin and Sam, who would have Austin over, and Austin couldn't say no, and so we set up, we helped, we helped him. You come and ask me, hey, can I go to Justin? If he crossed his hands, that means he didn't want to go. And so we said, no, you can't go. 
Well, I guess I can't go. <laughs> but that was just a, a thing for him. Morgan didn't have any problem telling me what she thought. <laughs> Titus didn't have any friends. No. <laughs> right, Gary? No. Okay. So anyway, that was, that's funny. But, um, so, so that was some of the things that we did. We played a lot of nerves, you know, games of Uno. I mean, you kind of go through moves. I think we see this at family camp, right? Those of us have been to family camp, you go and you play more games than you probably play all year long. You go, wow, this is like an unhidden thing. The things in our closet that we've already bought actually work if we try them at home and not have to go buy something else or go get another movie. You can actually do those things. And I think this is a huge thing. Um, uh, yeah. So when they were grumpy, we had what called grumpy night. And so if you were grumpy, Julie, or we all had to sing at the table. So please pass the salt. It changes that attitude, right? If they were like, there's nothing to do, Julie always had a list on the fridge. You say you're bored, here's something to do. So they never said that. So there's some of the things that we did. Um, Well, I put some yellow things on your table, and you don't have to take that. You're not going to hurt my feelings. This is a game that my dad taught me years ago. It's called Prince of Paris. Anybody play Prince of Paris? Okay, none of you played this. Drew hates games, so Drew's not this guy. So this is a game. And so what it is, is if, this is if you have a bunch of kids at the house. This works with adults and, and everything. So eight or more, you've got a guy that needs to be called. I'm always a caller, so... What I say is these words. I go, Prince of Paris lost his hat. And then I say a number. Number eight found it, eight to the foot. And so if you have eight players, everybody's numbered. And so if it was this table and say you were one, two, three, four, five, six, you need about eight to start it and you play this third. Right? And so I go, Prince of Paris lost that number two found it. Tiffany would go, who sir, me, sir? And you'd have to say, who sir, me, sir, before I said two found it, two to the foot. And then I go, yes, sir, you, sir, and he goes, and then that part will walk you through to help you learn it. No, sir, no, sir, then who, sir, and you would say a number. And she'd say number three, and it was Kyle, and I'd say three found it, three to the foot. Before I said three to the foot, he'd have to go, who, sir, me, sir? Now, I'm saying it really, really slow. But once we start playing this game, it, there's a language in the world. The Holy Spirit has come upon and there's tongues of fire. And there's a language that everybody understands that's playing the game. It's like, what's going to happen? And it's kind of, you come into one of those, it looks like a crazy thing, but that was a game that we don't play every time. I'm going to lose my voice. But it's, it's, it's all this, and there's some rules there. So, like, if you play with 10, 10 is the foot. Because 10, the last number is the foot. And as you move up, you keep the same number. So if Tim moves one, is at the foot, and somebody goes, number one found it, and you go, he's at the foot, and you go to the foot. The goal is to be at the top, right? And then you don't have to wait for them to stop and move their coffee. You just start it. And what happens is everybody's in a trance like this, trying to remember their number and not say the number again. So that's just, we, we always are looking for those kinds of things, some games. Name that tune is our go-to. That's why they know all my music, and I know all theirs. I mean, we spent trips for six hours playing that, and they get mad and argue. And, um, Titus, one of his favorite games was playing football in the living room, and they would be on their knees, and it's a nerf ball, two, and there was more than you jump in once while, and then if you catch them, you run the streets, eight in a row, nine, oh, it's a new record at the Wee's house, and they're talking trash, and then I accidentally threw an interception. Oh, Dad! Okay, and they're complaining. I go, okay, that's two, that's three. You know, you, you know, don't give a chance to complain. We did that, broke a few things, worth it. I mean, just, just, you know, things are things. Um, unless they're my things, and they really matter. <laughs> Those are just. I mean, we could go on and on on that, but um, um, we will continue to do that. Um, uh, I don't know if that was the answer because we played games, but what we did is that we were intentional about our home being a place where discipleship happened with us and then their kids and then their kids' friends. Um, um, that's, that's how we roll. And that's what we will continue to do. And so if you want popcorn and anything, you can come to our house and have them. We'll have it tonight. There's about 30 college kids coming over tonight. So that's what we got. We are finishing with that.
everything I have to say at this point is kind of irrelevant. So uh, why don't you just bow your head and we're going to pray. God, um, we thank you that um, you give us time here on earth to be with our families. And um, so many uh, times we get off track, we forget um, just the idea that the days are long and the years are short and they go by fast. And many days we can just be on the couch scrolling and just wasting opportunities. May we see our homes as a place um, of ministry, a place that um, relationships can be built and the gospel can be shared and places where people want to be and relationships uh, to happen and, and grow. We thank you so much for, for what you've given us in the time that we've been together here tonight. Lord, as we are uh, just looking at the next few weeks as we continue to work our way through this book, might you um, help us to understand it's not just new tips or different ways, but it's a different way of looking at life and then also the technology that, that is involved in life now. So God, give us the wisdom as we continue to go through this. In your name, amen. Uh, just two quick things. One, we need the tables and chairs put up like just last week and the week before. Also, when you're parking, I know we have a few people over here in the grass. This grass over here, um, we don't own that land. So if you could, whenever you're here parking at night, if there's not enough spaces here, if you could just do it alongside the road, that would help us out a lot and would keep us from being on someone else's property. So if you could do that, that would be helpful. Thank you.
what's right and what's wrong, and what I would do. A lot of it was luck that we ended up the way we ended up. And uh, 